welcome everyone to this week's SETI Colloquium. Uh, this week we have Daniel Ongerhausen from Goddard, uh, who will be giving a talk on sniffing exoplanet atmospheres, understanding their spectra, which will be a very important subject in the year of JWST. Uh, Daniel is an NPP from NASA Goddard. He worked with Mark Clampen. I was going to run through his bio, but he tells me his second slide is his bio, so I think I'll skip that. I restrict myself merely to making the presentation of the very rare and very prestigious SETI Colloquium mug. Oh, so thank you very much. Thank you. For, here, for taking the time to come out and talk with us. And uh, with that, you can take it away. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for letting me invite myself, basically. Mm. So happy to be here. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into the details, but I've been around quite a while, always following the money as most of us. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about how we analyze or how we get a sniff of alien atmospheres using all kinds of different uh, instruments. And that's one of the theme of my career is just trying new things, trying new instruments, trying new platforms. And uh, but I want to start with a little bit bigger picture. So the question of astrobiology, or if I talk to people about astrobiology and they ask me, you know, what is that? Actually, I think it's a word that was born here, kind of, right? Wasn't it? Uh, Ames thing, astrobiology. Anyway, so I always start with the uh, story of the blind man and the elephant. So it's like an old Indian or Thai, I guess, a legend where like three, four or five uh, blind men find, find an elephant and want to figure out what is that elephant. And the first guy is touching the back and he's like, hmm, for me that feels like a brush or something. The second guy is touching the leg and he's like, I don't know what you're seeing, but for me that's more like a tree or something like that. The third guy touches the side and it's like, that's like a stone if you ask me, or a big rock. And the second guy uh, um, touches the, um, the front and he's like, yeah, for me that's, that's neither, neither a rock nor a tree nor a, nor a brush or anything. And that's kind of how it goes in, in astrobiology. So we're all in our separate fields, kind of blind, kind of not really connected with the others. And if you want to understand that whole question of life in the universe, we really have to zoom out, stop using our lingo and really connect these different fields just as these blind men have to connect the different dots to understand that elephant. And um, I'm going to come back to this somewhat later in the, in the uh, talk. And I want to focus mostly on this astrophysics part, on exoplanets, which is the work that I am um, that I'm mostly involved in and um, actually want to point out that it's a really old question even though we found the first exoplanet 20 years ago it's almost 3,000 years ago that Epicurus started asking that question and then other really great minds like Bruno or Newton thought about the idea that there are other words uh, other worlds that are similar or maybe not similar to ours how many are there and uh, only one of them got killed for that idea so one of those three that's not too bad and um, it still took 300 years or 350 years um, after Newton that we, um, that we start slowly but surely to figuring out these questions with first of all stopping killing people for thinking about that and with improved technology we got to a point where we started to answer these questions and then probably most of you are aware that we got like the best even never expected answers to these questions. We even got amateurs discovering with um, planet hunters, for example, um, exoplanets. We find exoplanets, or in this case, maybe it's not real. We're still thinking about that one. In our closest neighborhood, we find planets that are um, potentially habitable. We, um, or basically you guys at, at Kepler, you basically double the number of planets that we know every year. We find really crazy ones like that Saturn on steroids, like a ring planet with like a huge ring. and. Um, we find planets around um, stars that, are, that we thought are way too old to even have planets. So we are really starting to answer these old, old questions. And that's, that's what makes me, on one hand, humble that I'm living at the right time to use the instruments to be um, answering these questions. And also kind of proud that I'm answering the question that these great minds you know, thought about for, for, um, for, for centuries. So being part of the community that answers that really old question is, is one of the drivers for me. And um, we are so successful with finding these exoplanets, mostly due to Kepler, but also with other, um, other detection methods, that we can start putting them in some sort of um, statistical context, and in this case, in a periodic table. So it's really just the um, size, so from uh, Mercury size towards uh, Jupiter size, and then just in three basic distance or um, temperature zones, so the hot zone, too hot for life, warm enough, that habitable zone and then too cold for life, basically. And what you can see is um, 
there's a huge crowd up here. That's mostly a, um, an observational bias. So this doesn't reflect the overall occurrence rates. This is mostly an observational bias. Obviously, it's easier to find big ones closer in because they have diff bigger transits. They have a stronger ray velocity signal. Um, so this, this whole trend is mostly observational bias. And with improving technology, we're pushing these, these boundaries farther and farther to the colder and smaller planets. Um, another interesting thing is if you compare this to our solar system, so same plot but with all the bodies from our solar system in there, you see it's really different. So we have all these rocky planets somewhat close in, our gas and ice giants somewhat farther out. And this was a picture in planetary um, uh, in planet formation for before we found the first exoplanet. We thought this is how solar systems look like. And if you go back to the, um, to the plot of the exoplanets, maybe it's not how solar systems look like. So we found, we find many of these close in gas giants, which we don't know how they got there. Um, um, we find these super Terrans, these mini Neptune super Earth planets, which we don't even have an analog in our solar system. Maybe Planet 9 is one of these. But this is m almost the biggest group of planets we find, and we don't have any analog to them. So it seems like we are finding stuff that's really different from what we have in our solar system, and that each of these planets are, um, are worth finding out about these hot Jupiters, about these super Earths. So these are really big questions right now that we have to answer before we maybe move on to the more habitable ones here. Um, so then the question is, why is it so difficult? Why did it take us 3,000 years to start answering that question? And the basic, very trivial answer is stars are bigger than planets, and stars are brighter than planets. I'm not sure if you can even see that. So this little dot here is Mercury. So this was the Mercury transit um, just two or three weeks ago. And this is, the, this is the challenge that we have to work with. I mean. Admittedly, that's the smallest planet by definition that we have, but it's still like a tiny, tiny little dot in comparison to that huge, noisy, sometimes active host star. So the techniques we use are either indirect methods, so the star is doing something that, that makes us um, conclude that there's a star, or we need more like brute force methods, canceling out the stellar light. That's what the chronography folks do, just pushing, pushing, pushing until we push, push down the uh, stellar contribution to the 10 to the 10 contrast ratios to actually separate these um, planetary fluxes from the stellar fluxes. And um, the technique that I mostly use is actually similar to this one or in, in principle the same. We're looking for transits and these photometric changes when the planets um, cross around the stars. And um, that's what we call differential photometry. So. And for some systems, we are lucky enough that we look edge on the system. And in most cases, we got these primary transits where the planet moves in front of the stellar disk and the light drops a little bit. Then it does that whole orbit around here. And then depending on the geometry, in most cases, it also disappears behind the star. And if you look at the differences between these phases or in the, in the change of the stellar light, we can reveal information about the planet. And, um, this is how typically a light curve like that looks like. That was the first, or maybe the second, half-orbit light curve, in this case of HD 1 at night, 733b, one of the benchmark golden standard hot Jupiters, one of the first transiting exoplanets we found. And this was observed at uh, 8 microns, so somewhere in the infrared with um, the Spitzer Space Telescope by Heather Knudsen. And you can see here, this first big dip, this is the primary transit, so about in this case, 3%, basically the area ratio between planet and star. And then you got this long baseline here, which is why the planet is moving around here. And then you got this somewhat smaller secondary eclipse, basically the, um, um, the uh, ratio of the fluxes you get from the, from the star and the planet. And um, in this case, roughly a factor of 10 for the Sol Jupiter, fact factor of 10 smaller than the primary eclipse. But there's more to it. So this, what looks like a straight line here, if you zoom into it, you can actually see this sinusoidal shape on top of that phase curve. And that's what we call it, orbital phase curves. So you can basically see the, the day side of the planet moving towards us over the orbit. So right after primary eclipse, you see the dark night side of the planet uh, facing us. And then over the orbit, the day side is moving towards us and slightly increasing that signal of the, um, of the phase curve. And we can draw a lot of information just from that, that curve. We can get day sides, night sides by comparing that bottom here, which is basically the night side, towards that bottom here, which is uh, the contribution by the day side. Um, another thing we can see here is that, that 
brightest spot is slightly shifted from the secondary eclipse. So if our hottest part or the most, the brightest part of the planet was right in the center of it on the substellar point, we would, um, we would um, expect this to be right in the secondary eclipse. But because this bright spot or this peak of the phase curve happens before the secondary eclipse, we can conclude that that hot spot is slightly shifted from the substellar point. So there must be some sort of winds maybe that transport that hot spot towards the side. So in a sense, we can actually map exoplanets in a really crude way, but we can map the um, energy distribution on these exoplanet uh, surfaces with these observations. And that's actually the first thing that I worked on. So I was working at RPI in uh, Troy, upstate New York, and this project actually won an undergrad, undergraduate research prize, and we went to Capitol Hill, uh, me and my student, M. Delarm, and um, what we did was taking these secondary eclipses, so all these little dips here are secondary eclipses, so when the planet disappears behind the star in the Kepler data set, and also these phase curves, and fitted the secondary eclipses and phase curves, and long story short, we were able to go for about 20 planets, derive their brightness temperatures, their albedos, and the night side temperatures. And um, at that time, that was, I think, one of the papers with the largest group of consistently and comprehensively derived parameters. And then we also, obviously, if you get a statistically meaningful sample, you also try to find some correlations. Um, in this case, there's a lot in this. So this is the um, albedo on this side versus the incoming flux. So people thought maybe if they are highly irradiated, they become more reflective or the other way around. Then we also have the, uh, um, the log G of the host star and the metallicity of the host star. And you can't really see any correlation in here. So if there was anything, um, any of these parameters changing, changing the um, albedo, there would be some sort of um, correlation in here. The only thing we can say they are really dark or really low in albedo in comparison to Jupiter. So Jupiter has an albedo of 0.5, and all these hot Jupiters are down here. So that's kind of counterintuitive, right? One would expect if they are so close and if they are highly irradiated, there might be like white glowing or something, but they're actually charcoal. So, so these hot Jupiters, at least in the optical, in, in, in the Kepler bands, are pretty dark or pretty pretty um, low in re reflectivity. So that was the first thing um, in phase curves. Then another work was um, also when I was in upstate New York with um, Ben Plesek, who is now starting at Wentworth as a professor this um, fall. Um, I was partly um, supervising his um, PhD work. And uh, he built a Bayesian phase curve modeling and retrieval tool called ExoNest. Um, all these phase curves, you can imagine there are tons of parameters that are going in, and many of them are highly degenerate. So for example, these secondary eclipses, albedo, um, so the reflected light and the emitted light are really uh, highly degenerate, and you need, really need Bayesian methods to um, decorrelate that and to um, visualize these, um, deco uh, these um, <coughs> degeneracies. And um, this is just one example. Um, the phase curve models made with um, ExoNest, and in this case, we could, um, first of all, prove a planet without the transit, so really just from the from the uh, phase curve, you can confirm the planet from, from the Kepler data. And we could even confirm that it's an eccentric planet. So it's an eccentric versus non-eccentric uh, model. And this is just one example. So we have about three or four papers just using that XNS code, one with John, where we looked at a certain, uh, certain Kepler candidate. So it's a really great tool. And we also applied it already for a um, combination of tests and Kepler data. We just started to also um, apply that code to um, to gravitational microlensing data that might be coming up from, from Kepler. So it's a really nice and um, really nice tool, that code, and really, uh, uh, really versatile. So this is another thing on phase curves. Um, then another application of phase curves, so we are still only talking about Kepler here, um, is looking for exotrojans. So I was living in upstate New York and Troy, and you know, there's, so, there's so many trojans around me in Troy. I thought about, you know, what about maybe there are some trojans in the Kepler data. So for those of you, just a quick um, recap. So if you have a star planet system, you got these, uh, you got four gravitational stable Lagrange points. And um, in two of them, L4 and L5, um, they basically act like a gravitational uh, trap. So everything that's floating around eventually ends up there. So it's kind of like a cosmic trash can. And um, so all of this stuff eventually all that leftover from the planetary formation process ends up in these, um, in these Lagrange points and builds these clouds of so-called Trojans. And um, the cool thing about these Trojans is they always appear at the same phase. So even if you have a 60-day orbit or a 600-day orbit, 
they always should be at the same orbital phase. And that was the idea that we had. So if you, um, if you look at, at planets and, and look for them, uh, or look for Trojans in the Kepler data set, they should always appear at the same point of time. So if you have the big transit here in the center, they should always appear in transit here and there. But obviously these signals are super small. So we're talking about uh, parts per million. So you probably won't see it in a single system. So our idea was, what if we put all the Kepler data on top of each other? And that's kind of, so there's a little bit more to that paper, so I refer you to look at the paper. There are a couple of more statistical tests that we did. But in principle, what we did, we folded all, or almost all Kepler planets, 4,000 planets with 90,000 phase curves on top of each other. And then eventually, there's statistically significant dips at the L4 and L5 popped out. So if you really compress the whole Kepler data set, funnel it, and get one plot out of all phase curves on top of each other, you get these little dips in the L4 and L5. And you can see here, this is PPM flux, so we're really talking two, three parts per million here that these dips caused, maybe caused by Trojans are deep. The thing is, that's only like a two, three sigma detection, so we didn't want to lean out of the window too far and call it a detection, so we call it evidence for exotrojans. As I, as I mentioned, there are a couple of other tests. One test we did, for example, is if you see a dip in L4, or if you see a dip anywhere in the light curve, um, is there a correlated dip at another point? And there's only, the only correlation is between L4 and L5. So if you see a dip in L4, there's also highly likely a dip in L5, but there's no other phase, so there's not, if you see a dip at point one, you don't see a dip at, at point seven. So the only correlation is really between these two points. So there are a couple of statistical tests, and <clears throat> actually for that paper, we got uh, an extra statistical, um, a referee um, that had to look at the paper, so we are quite confident that at least our methods were, were fine, so, but we still didn't call it in a detection, just the evidence for these exotrojans. And um, I mean, the shape makes sense, the size kind of makes sense, so um, the depth of, the, of these tiny transits um, refer to something like Ganymede size, so, so one, one body the size of Ganymede or one million bodies with a kilo kilometer size, diameter, so this is kind of like the same ballpark as Jupiter, so it smells like Trojans, it sounds like Trojans, so it might actually be Trojans, but we didn't want to um, um, call it an actual detection. Um, okay, so all the stuff I showed so far was Kepler data, so really just one color in the Kepler band, but of course it's much more interesting, so you get a whole dimension, more of information if you do these observations um, spectroscopically, so that's what we call spectrophotometry, because you can either go from a spectroscopic instrument and bin down, or you can use, as in this case, a couple of um, photometric channels at the same time and observe these transits or um, eclipses. And then you can do this again in primary eclipse, where you probe the terminator, so while the planet is moving in front of the star, you've got this thin layer mostly of the upper atmosphere, the terminator region of the planet, absorbing light during the transit. And then if you have something that absorbs, your planet appears, um, appears uh, bigger, so you get a deeper transit, and if there's nothing that absorbs in the atmosphere, your transit is somewhat shallower. And um, these spectral features are of the order of 10 to the minus 4 for these on Jupiter. So the absorption of, let's say, methane in the, in the ter terminator gives a 10 to the minus 4 shallower transit or deeper transit than the continuum. Um, then the same observation you can do in secondary eclipse when the planet disappears behind the star. There the light that's missing during that eclipse is mostly the emitting day side of the planet. So you can um, observe that high up in the air, low pressure, auto terminator, and then somewhat deeper pressures inside of the planet with the secondary eclipses and get a quite nice picture, you know, rough idea of what, what's going on um, in these exoplanets. And, um, Interestingly enough, so these, the broadband depth, so the second eclipse is about a factor 10 smaller or less, less deep than the uh, primary transits, but the spectral features, so an emission line versus the continuum, are again on the 10 to the minus 4 um, level. So that's uh, it's the signal to noise. It's still high, you know, 10 to the minus 4 for hot Jupiter is, is quite a challenge, but it's the same for primary and secondary eclipses. So, so that's also somewhat counterintuitive because people usually think these secondary eclipses are much harder, but the signal to noise we have to go if we don't want to do spectroscopy is pretty much the same. Okay, so how does that work? Really short, um, um, short uh, explanation how we get to the spectra. So then each of these transit or eclipse-like curves represent the spectral value at that, um, 
at that wavelength. So in this case, an observation um, with Hubble Nigmos in 2009 when I was working at JPL with, um, with Max Main. So that's the day side of HD 209, another hot Jupiter, benchmark hot Jupiter. And then each of these brown, uh, each of these black crosses here represent the secondary eclipse light curve depths at that wavelength. And then at that time in 2009, we got away with just forward modeling. So we called our, we called our colleagues, in this case, Giovanna Tinetti in London, to model these atmospheres. So she put in a water atmosphere that didn't, didn't fit at all, then added some methane to the mixture, and we got this green model that kind of fit the data, but still not really good enough. And just as we added um, methane and CO2 to the mixture, we got a spectrum that um, kind of fit our data. And this is what we did in 2009, so really just forward modeling comparison. But this whole comparison, that whole spectral retrieval became like a huge field. So I could give like at least two other talks just about these retrieval of um, composition of uh, temperature and pressure profiles just from these, from these, um, from these spectra. So this, what I just call comparison here is really, really a tricky business and also involves mostly these Bayesian methods that I, that I mentioned before. So um, just as a warning, that's not just forward modeling that we do with these, with these spectra. Okay, so then the question is, what can we do right now? So as I mentioned before, these hot Jupiters are the easy ones. They are relatively hot, so they are kind of bright in the wavelengths we observe. They are big, they have a huge, they have a huge uh, signal on, on, on the planet, uh, higher contrast ratios, and the questions we are able to answer right now is, are there any interactions? Is there, is there, um, is the host star blowing away material from, from the planet? Um, how does that whole day-night side heat exchange work? Since most of them are tightly locked, they got a super hot uh, day side and a super cold night side, and we don't really understand in which cases the heat gets transported to the, from the hot side to the, to the night side. So all these questions we are able to tackle with the instruments we have right now. And one, um, from my perspective, the best observation we ever had um, from, um, from, from Hubble is this phase resolved emission spectrum of WASP 43. So WASP 43, one of the hottest and therefore highest contrast hot Jupiters. And uh, this is not work by me, this is work by Kevin Stevenson. Um, so they observed 61 orbits with Hubble, so quite a huge chunk of um, time they needed with Wide Field Camera 3 over a couple of orbits of um, WASP 43, and then were able to first of all derive that emission spectrum at different phases. So it goes, so this is like the day side going up to the day side here and then going back to the night side. This is the night side, so you can see this water absorption feature in, in, uh, in, depending on the, on the uh, phase. Then also thermal profiles, thermal profiles depending on the phase. So it, it, you don't really have an inversion anyway. So if you, go, if you go to the day side, there might be a tiny inversion. And then they also got these brightness temperatures map, maps that I mentioned before that from these phase curves and the shifts in the phase curve, we can also derive some crude first order maps of the heat distribution of, um, of these, uh, the surfaces. And this is really just a glimpse at what's possible in the future. So we probably can do similar stuff with James Webb on colder planets, on somewhat smaller planets. So this is really just a first glimpse at what's gonna be possible in the future. And that's why I like this animation and showing this picture. This is really the first time that someone opened the door to sneak peek what's, what's going to be cool in, in exoplanet photometry in the next couple of years. Um, another question, as I mentioned before, this whole super Earth versus mini Neptune, these intermediate sized planets that we don't have an analog in our solar system for, that's also a question we slowly but surely are able to tackle with the current instrumentation. So figure out where is the transition region? At what size does the rocky planet become an uh, ice giant? So all these questions are also in reach. And then obviously the big question, going back to the guys in the beginning, answering the big question, uh, is there life out there? Can we eventually use this technique of transit spectroscopy to find these, to find these um, fingerprints of life, what we call biomarkers? And right now, the most promising, at least for life as we know it, is if we find oxygen and methane at the same time. And there's a nice anal analogy that I got from one of my colleagues. It's like grad students and pizza. <laughs> so if you have both in the same room at the same time, there has to be a 
someone has to bring the pizza, there has to be Papa John bringing pizza because these grad students eat the pizza all the time. And so that's the same for oxygen and meat. And if you put both in the same room, they can't exist. They just eat each other off. So you either have something producing oxygen or something producing methane, and that's most probably going to be life. So this is the grad students and pizza comparison to oxygen and methane, why we think these are pretty good biomarkers. And, um, but the, quest, the, the big problem for this is actually that the atmosphere is not just um, the biosphere. So we got all this, we got volcanism, we got, we got um, northern lights, we got all these different processes that contribute to the atmosphere. And, um, and that's really one of these elephants that I mentioned in the beginning. So, so figuring out what is, a, what, is a, um, what is a smoking gun for life, what is a real biomarker really needs atmospheric chemistry, needs climate modelers, needs geologists. So this is a really uh, a question that we can only tackle as the whole astrobiology community with input from, from all the other fields. And then usually they tell us, yeah, we find this tiny little signature and we're like, yeah, we can't really observe that with our telescope. So we have to iterate that. So <clears throat> that's one of the big questions that uh, many people f um, figure out right now. Also because we want to build the next mission like HABEX, LUVA, all these potential life finder missions, and we have to define that now. We have to, we have to find biomarkers and, and define the, um, the sensitivities to build these telescopes. So we can't wait to, to define these biomarkers in 20 years when we have the missions, but we have to define them now to give um, the um, mission design an input, um, what we're looking for. Okay, going back from the future, back to the past, how I started, and from space back to the ground. Um, I actually started my career trying all this awesome observations from the ground, and um, looking back, it obviously failed. So um, as you know, it's usually much cheaper, even with these awesome telescopes in Hawaii and Chile, it's still much cheaper and much easier to get time on them than from space. And usually you also have access to bigger dishes, so you can get higher sensitivities, you usually have better resolution instruments. So there are a couple of advantages if you could transport that technique from, this, from space to the ground. On the other hand, there's obviously our atmosphere um, killing stuff, then um, you got weather and all these other problems from the ground. So it was really not trivial to, to do these observations, these awesome observations with Kepler, Spitzer, HSD from space, um, also on the ground. There were a couple of observations that worked, a couple didn't work out, but we never really found a workhorse that does similar awesome observations from the ground continuously or repeatedly, and it's only the last couple of years that we got two new instruments that might, at least in the infrared or in the near infrared, that might close that gap. One is uh, MOSFIRE at Keck, an instrument that I observed a couple of times with. It basically works um, with a huge slit mask. So you can, um, so this is in the optical path. You can build um, completely arbitrary slit mask. In this, um, in this case, you got these tiny little holes here where you can put a star in each of these holes and get a spectrum for each of the stars. But you can, in principle, also take all these registers and make a pure image out of that. And what we use for our observations is basically making a long and wide slit, so like a 12 arc second, 30, 15 arc second a wide slit, where we put our transiting host star and a comparison star in the slit, because we figured out in our early observations that slit losses, so that tiny little wiggle of our star in the slit already kills our 10 to the minus 4 um, signal to noise. And we can also compare, so we can put a comparison star in the same, in the same slit, so we can, com uh, we can compare for the uh, correcting the atmosphere and we avoid these slit losses. So that's why we think um, this um, MOSFIRE at Keck might be a great instrument to do these observations also from the ground. Um, another even more complicated instrument is KMOS at the VLT. That's not just a multi-object uh, uh, multi um, spectroscope, it's actually a multi-object integral field unit. So you got these um, it's, a huge, it's a huge thing, it's like a, um, it's more, more than a school bus sized instrument. You've got these tiny, 24 tiny arms that you can put into your field of view and then each of these tiny arms has a, a mirror on the tip that reflects your star that is in that aperture on, uh, on an integral field unit. So you get a data cube for each, of these, uh, for each of these stars. So you basically get a 3D image plus, um, plus a spectrum into the wall for each of these um, for each of these uh, um, objects in your field of view. And I got a science verification proposal accepted in 2013 um, that didn't really work out because there were technical issues as there's usually um, when you do science verification, then 
I got two nights in 2014. I went to the Atacama Desert, and maybe some of you remember that picture when suddenly all the flowers bloomed in the Atacama Desert because it rained for the first time in three years. <laughs> that was the night that I observed. So, <laughs> so uh, got one night in the Atacama Desert, and then it's the night in five years where it rained. So all the technicians and engineers were taking selfies because it was so rare that it rains at, at Paranal, and unfortunately it was the night that I was there. And um, the second night we had bad wind speeds, so I could technically point anywhere at the sky but where my object was, just because the high wind was coming from that direction, so didn't work out in 2015. Then I went again um, last year, in 2015, but the moment I got off the plane in Chile, I got a call that they had a power failure and they couldn't get my uh, instrument cold enough for my observation, so I just spent a week in Santiago watching the uh, Copa America and couldn't observe. But then I went home and then they finally, so in the sixth try or, or fifth try, they finally got an observation that worked. And we are currently reducing the data and it, it looks promising. So I don't want to promise too much, but um, maybe just stay tuned for that. So it's tricky from the ground. That's basically the take-home message here. What seems to be relatively easy from, from space is really, it's really a pain from the ground. But I'm still, I still think we need to push it because you can take a lot of pressure off James Webb if you can take at least some of these observations from the ground. Also, in, in terms of pre-vetting our targets for James Webb, I think ground-based is still important to do. So the thing is, if it doesn't work from the ground, but works from space, why not go on a plane, right? So you all know, you probably all know Sophia here. It's a telescope on a plane. I'm not sure if you can read this. So enough is enough. I had it with these ground-based observations. So. Um, so yeah, why not putting a plane? Why not putting a telescope on a plane? And this is also um, a thing that I pushed for quite a while when I was um, graduating from the German Sophia Institute. So I've been connected to Sophia for quite a while. Um, I don't think I have to um, I have to introduce Sophia too much here because most of you should know about Sophia. So it's um, that awesome 2.5 meter telescope on 747. It's a German um, US um, um, joint venture. It's observing slightly higher altitudes than um, commercial airplanes. The first generation of instruments is seven images in spectra, basically covering everything from the optical to the um, submillimeter range. It's supposed to operate for 20 years with about 120 um, nights per year. A couple of milestones. In April 07 was the first flight of the observatory, which was tricky enough to put a 16-ton telescope on the back of a plane instead of 300 sacks of water that usually are on a plane like this. Then December 09, the first open door flight, that's I think the video that's shown here, at least the first flight where they opened the door fully. And then in May 2010, the first light observation, and then since 2011, it's in um, operational science operations. We can um, basically propose for observations just like any other telescope. Unless you're German, then you can only proposed in Germany, but in principle it's like all other telescopes, it's uh, geo time, so you can apply for time on Sophia. Um, there are a couple of advantages for these transit observations, at least in theory. Um, it's operating in the wide wavelength regime, so where all this uh, funky photochemistry happens that we're interested in. It's a mobile platform, so you can imagine these transits don't happen every day, and then sometimes you only got one transit a year, and that happens coincidentally just observable from somewhere in the southern Pacific. So with Sophia as a mobile platform, in theory, you can go where these rare transits happen. Obviously, it has less atmosphere, so one of the main reasons why Sophia is built. So we got less um, total absorption, but also less variability. Because we observe time series, also the variability of the atmosphere that's much lower up there is important for us. And then the other cool thing about Sophia is the dedicated, you can put dedicated instrumentation on it. So not like Hubble, where you have to send like a super dangerous, expensive, um, uh, expensive space shuttle mission with astronauts. You have to train for years to just exchange an instrument. Sophia, in that sense, is a space telescope that comes home every morning. You push it in the hangar and put on the newest instrumentation, the latest detectors, the coolest spectrographs you can get. So that's a really great advantage of Sophia over, over space-based um, telescopes. And um, after pushing that for a time, we actually got our first exoplanet observation. Um, here you can see the Maybe it's a little bit too dark, but the exoplanet hunter team. So we got um, Eric Becklin, Ian McLean, Ted Dunham. So a couple of um, really important people in the field that were, were helping 
as we said, um, observation, and it was on um, October 1st, 2013. So I think many of you are federal um, contractors or working for the government. So do you remember what happened October 1st, 2013? Shutdown, right? So um, actually our flight was scheduled to leave at 8.55, so five minutes before midnight in Washington so that we could leave in time before the shutdown. If, if the flight plan was you know, made so that we start at 9.05, we probably would have stayed on ground. So we, we left Palm there, got into air, and then 10 minutes into the air, the pilot um, said, yeah, by the way, um, we don't have a government anymore. <laughs> and, then, uh, <clears throat> and then we flew up to Canada. So we um, flew up to Canada, turned around, and returned to, to Palm there. And while we were um, in Canadian air, in airspace, we were kind of joking, you know, maybe you should go down. and. <laughs> Uh, ask for scientific asylum for a while or something like that. So, so that was October 1st. And um, we had a couple of te uh, technical problems that night, but we actually got a transit. So unfortunately, in the beginning, our instrument was uh, not really working as we, uh, as we wanted, or a couple of instruments we used. But we were able to um, point at our star about 10 minutes before for transit. And this is the really nice transit light curve we got uh, from Sophia. And this is really raw data. This is um, what I call absolute photometry, so we don't need a comparison star, as you usually people you know, who do um, variable stars from the ground need, no, you need, always need a comparison star, even, even Kepler in a sense needs comparison stars with the CBVs that you use. So, so this is really just putting a, an aperture around our host star, PSF, and just extracting the data. So this is, and this is actually a proof that we are operating some we're in, space, in a space-based environment because these observations without the comparison stars are really only possible from the ground. So this was the first proof that Sophia as a platform actually gives us space-based quality data. And if you keep in mind that, we in, that we're observing a difference here, so we're observing A minus B, so out of transit versus transit. So we're really limited by only 10 minutes before and after transit. So this is also something to keep in mind. But even with that kind of like um, not optimal data, if you compare that to previous observations with uh, Hubble or Spitzer, here color-coded, Sophia at least gets close to that. So within two or three um, times the sensitivity, and again, you know, remember first time you used it, really limited observing time, we got down to about one and a half times the photon noise and uh, um, sensitivities of 180, 160 uh, ppm. So again, um, a proof that Sophia plays could play as a platform could play in that league with these um, with these uh, uh, space-based platforms. But that's another observation: a transit of GJ 3740b of Vorm Uranus that we observed with a Passion Alpha filter um, of Sophia in the flight with a flight cam infrared instrument, and then another channel um, in the I band with FBI. And this is also one. Um, unique thing for Sophia that you can use the beam splitter and observe in the optical and the infrared at the same time. I'm not sure yet if there's anything from the ground. Definitely nothing that can observe at space quality at these wavelengths parallelly. And this is the flight path we took. So we flew out of Palmdale, got up here, similar actually to that October observation that I meant, went up here uh, to Canada and then back here. And the thing you can see here is if when we return in the morning, you can see the morning come. So you can see the sunrise here, right? And one of the um, constraints with Sophia is that we have to land before sunrise. So NASA is scared that you know, we point at the sun, and then we cannot close our door, and then sun falls into the telescope, and hell is going to break uh, out on the plane. So that's why we are constrained. And the problem in, in this case was our transit just ended 10 minutes before, before sunrise. So we really had to come back. Um, right after the transit observation to be in Palm there before, um, before the sun is up. And this is actually one of the uh, problems with Sophia in practice. So this whole flight planning is a really huge constraint for these transit observations, even though in principle it's a, it's a mobile platform and we could go where the best um, environment for these transit observations is. All these constraints, there are also a couple of, um, actually quite many um, military zones here that Sophia can fly through and uh, the constraints to come back and start and land in Palmdale and to come back before sunrise, this really actually makes it hard to find uh, perfect conditions or a perfect flight plan to, to suit these, um, to suit these um, exoplanet transit observations. Um, another that's more a general problem for us, in, in, for us transit observers in general is that the instruments are not well suited. You can imagine if someone builds an astronomical instrument, you usually build it to, to, to take long-term exposures of 
something faint, right? You look at a you look at a, a faint galaxy for 15 minutes to get your signal to noise, and then you point at the next target. But this is our targets are actually super bright, and we only do a couple of snapshot observations, but have to be stable over time. So this really has a, has different and you know has a different requirements to this to the instrument than standard astronomical observations. So this is why we in general have problems using standard instruments. For example, when I go to Keck. I usually ask them to defocus, just so that we can spread our signal a little bit more over the detector, that we can use longer integration times on these bright targets. And obviously, people are crazy. I mean, we don't build a 10-meter telescope, and then you come and defocus it. So, so um, that's, a huge, that's, that's a general, not, not just the Sophia problem, it's just a, um, a general problem for the observations we do. And then, obviously, there's a lot of competition with the mid and far infrared, where Sophia is really unique and really um, the only platform available for the whole community. So we, we really have to compete with our science cases, which, which these science cases that totally rely on Sophia because there's no Herschel, there's, as far as I know, no mid or far infrared space mission plan. So this is why Sophia in practice um, has some constraints for these observations. And um, I mean, it's clear that Sophia was never supposed to be any kind of survey mission. So, so just because of the limits in time and the instrumentation that cycles through, but um, I think there are a couple of unique science cases that really only work with Sophia, and I keep on, I keep on applying with them, and uh, hopefully we get some time again. And these two papers are also in the making, so maybe once they are out, we got a little bit more arguments to keep observing with Sophia. Okay, f um, finishing up here, looking forward, most of you might have heard about um, the Swiss or European Keops mission coming up, then obviously TESS coming and James Webb coming. So the future is really bright for exoplanet transit observations. So we got um, three missions or two missions completely dedicated to it and a huge part of James Webb also hopefully dedicated to, to exoplanet transit observations. So um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here and I don't wanna, that's a, again another talk. One thing that I wanna point out though is um, that we really, that one of the most important things we have to do in the next two, three, four years is to um, organize the traffic. So the um, KEOPS and TESS mission are really, really close to each other. So the first data release from um, TESS probably is around the same time you have to put the first targets into the James Webb pipeline. So what's really important for us is to um, do that whole follow-up work and kind of um, organize the traffic. So like. The interesting super Earths, we put them on the fast lane, and the boring hot Jupiters, we maybe put them, you know, on the detour. And it's really important um, because we only have limited time with James Webb, and we we might just get a shot at one super Earth, and then the question is, when do we pull our trigger? Do we wait until the end of TESS to find our perfect target, or do we wait half of the lifetime of TESS to go at a not so good target? And if you only get time for 10 hot Jupiters, which are the 10 you choose out of the 100 we have? So this is really questions we have to answer now and not wait for James Webb to come. And to summarize this, so this is like a summary slide taken from George Ricker's uh, test talk. Um, so this is realistically the questions we can answer with James Webb. So there are some people who think we might be eventually able to get the first signs of habitability for some wet super Earths, but realistically, we should be able to close that whole hot Jupiter topic. How does that heat day-night side redistribution thing work? How do inversions work in these atmospheres? And also, how do, they, how, how do they form in the first place? We don't really know how these hot guys got so close into their, to the host stars. So I think realistically we can close that chapter or really get big answers in these and maybe point at a couple of um, at these um, wet hot super Earths, but um, realistically, unless we get really, really lucky, we probably won't get biomarkers with James Webb. And, um, um, but it's still like, I mean, it sounds a little bit disappointed, but um, I'm still excited to, to uh, observe with James Webb and answer all these questions. And um, that's basically the end of my talk. I usually have this um, a video of the um, uh, two of my um, Sophia observations. So I took my little GoPro camera on the plane and just put it in certain corners while we were observing. And usually I let, just let that video run while we do some question and answers. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, before I open it up for questions, I remind you we are being recorded. This will all show up on YouTube, but most importantly, stick up your hand, wait until the microphone gets to you so people online will be able to hear what you're, what you're asking. 
Thank you. That was really cool. Um, the uh, given the limits you have on observation mm -hmm. times and and tools to observe with, have uh, you or one of your colleagues looked at the spectral signature of that wacky WTF star with the 22% dip? And and if if so, what kind of information could you glean from looking at the spectral uh, um, changes? Yeah, I made a mistake to actually work on this planet, and uh, then we got a lot of press. So. Um, um, okay, where do I start with this planet? It's like such a huge topic. So um, I think it's great. It's great that we got this planet and got the public interested in it. It might become a little bit more dangerous in the future. You know, if you want to ask for money for Habex in 10 years, and then people say, wait, you, want, you found that alien mega structure 10 years ago. Why do you need money for Habex? You know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, we just have to make sure that we don't start to become, you know, water on Mars or Voyager left the uh, left the solar system kind of guys. Um, yeah, what's what's your typical alien megastructure spectral, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, profile I mean, look like? I mean, it's, it, don't get me wrong. I think it's it's it shouldn't be a taboo to think about it. Uh, that's totally. And it, and I think the coolest message here is that we actually, and that come, goes back to that question or that the, the questions I showed in the beginning, that we are the first generation that actually has the instrument to to eventually answer that question. Even if we don't find an alien mega structure, we have the instruments to do that in the first time of human history. And that's, that's, that's the biggest message here. And, uh, and if it engages the, the public, I mean, it's a good thing, right? So. Yeah, but can you find out what it really is? Can you um, find out what it really is with uh, spectral? Um, I mean, hopefully already with, with um, follow-up photometry, but um, with James Webb, we definitely get a big, bigger, bigger picture of the infrared axis. I think that's the biggest question right now, if there's anything. Even if there were alien megastructure, they have to re-radiate whatever they are doing in, in the infrared, and obviously, or apparently, there is none of that. So, so we definitely could get a better grip of that IR question for that star. So yeah, James Webb is going to help with everything, so yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I was fascinated by your um, result on extracellular trojans, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could say anything more about the possible distribution of uh, objects or, or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, first of all, it was as, you, as, as you've seen, it's a really it was a really small signature even for the whole sample. So, in the first version of our paper, we tried to look at um, you know certain distances, for example, but. If you only get a two sigma detection on the whole sample, you don't really want to cut it in smaller boxes. So we did that in the first version, and that extra statistical referee we got said, you know, take it out again. <clears throat> and the first thing, so there's actually more to that paper, and I can explain that now that you asked. So in the beginning, we took all Kepler planets and didn't find, put all of them on top of each other. So really from the short distances where we wouldn't even expect Trojans because of stability reasons to the really long distances. And for them, we found an upper limit of about one, so we call it a culting, a culting area analog, so something like one object that would have 450 kilometer diameter. So, so that's the upper limit for the whole sample. And what we did then, we did a statistical test. So if we see a dip in L4, we also see a dip in L5. So what we did then was for every um, exoplanet or for every Kepler planet, we found a dip in L5. We took the second half of the light curve and for everyone, we found a dip in L5. We took the first half of the light curve and then put all of these together. And for these, we found these uh, tiny little dips, which are analog, which are, as I mentioned, to one object of 100 kilo, uh, 1,000 kilometer diameter or 1 million objects of, of a kilo, kilometer size. And that's kind of like the same ballpark as, as Jupiter. And also, the shape you have seen, maybe you have seen this shape is more like almond shape. It's not like a deep dip, so it's also like the distribution you would you would um, assume for Trojans in these, you know, elongated um, orbits around, around L2. So, as I said, you know, it all smells like Trojans, sounds like Trojans. So, um, and it's not like a super crazy claim. It's not like an LA mega structure, right? So, so we have we have Trojans everywhere, everywhere in our solar system. So it's kind of like um, ex expected to also see them out there. So, yeah, does it answer your question? What kind of features would you like to see in a perfect SOFIA instrument for the work that you do? Um, we actually submitted one to the first call of 
for our extra instruments. So um, it, that was a study called Nimbus, and I really liked the idea. So that was the multi-imager. So it had like a couple of dichroics, and you had like four fields, uh, eight field of, fields of view. So you got like eight photometric channels at the same time, and these channels were chosen that they fit right in these windows you can't observe from the ground, so right between H and K, between K and M. So you got like eight channels that are completely complementary to what's done from the ground, and it's like, it's like all images, so it's kind of like easier to, to reduce. So you get like eight channel photometry at the same time. So this was an instrument. Um, we actually submitted to the first call of, of instruments, but now we are getting too close to James Webb that it's probably not really makes sense to put, put like a dedicated um, instrument on Sophia, but maybe something like that on a balloon. So I know that people are also thinking about a dedicated exoplanet balloon to do some of that stuff to get pressure off of James Webb and to do this whole vetting thing before James Webb to characterize which are the best objects for James Webb, so, yeah. All right, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank the speaker again and look forward to seeing you all next week.